Our first presenters uh, are folks who are going to talk about the Platte River Restoration Project. David Bosch and Tom Smerdell. Got it. <laughs> it's one of these names that only has one vowel and lots of consonants, and mm -hmm. it's, sort of, it's a struggle for me to figure out how to pronounce those names. So uh, they, they work with the Headwaters Corporation. And it's really interesting relative to the talk that we had last night because the things they're going to talk about, and we, we mentioned last night, is sort of being concerned about uh, species, you know, sort of the protection of, of endangered species and the strategies and efforts that need to happen if we're going to create a sustainable environment and being mindful of those sorts of things. So these gentlemen are working really hard to try and make sure that that kind of thing can happen against difficult odds because they don't get to control all the world that they're trying to work in. And so it becomes a real, a real challenge when you, you don't get to control the full ecological environment. You have to work within it in a different way. And I'm sure they're going to give us great insight into that as a part of their talk today. So welcome and take it away. All right, that's a, I'll just click that one off. And hey, everybody. Can everyone hear me OK? Great. Uh, my name is Tom Smerdell. I'm with Headwaters Corporation out of Kearney, Nebraska. We're a, you could probably call it a natural resources consulting firm, but really our, our one and main project is we're the executive director for the Platte River Recovery Implementation Program. Uh, I am the fluvial geomorphologist, so my role for the program is paying attention to the channel bed, kind of what you see in blue where there's water, and keeping that good for the habitat that we're trying to create and protect. Um, this is basically our one project. We have a few other things kind of around Colorado and Nebraska, but the Platte River Recovery Limitation Program, or the program, is really what we do. Um, what it is, the program is an endangered species recovery program. It's not a river restoration program per se, but the river itself in a braided plan form like you saw in the previous slide is kind of the underpinning of, of what, why we're doing what we're doing. And, and what we're doing is providing ESA mitigation compliance for upstream users upstream of the loop confluence. If you, in blue is the Platte Basin, in green is the associated habitat reach, which is where we focus all of our habitat projects and activities. And everyone upstream of that blue polygon is responsible in the basin to offset any consumptive uses that they might have. So for example, out on the front range of Denver, you can see up there in that lower lobe, if someone has a water project that has depletions or something, they're responsible to offset those depletions for down, the downstream habitat. And the program was essentially formed to do that for people. So we didn't have just utter chaos of people in Denver trying to figure out what's going on in Grand Island and how they can mitigate the habitat for the cranes and terns and plovers and pallet sturgeon, the, the animals that we're essentially trying to recover that have been not doing so well lately. So how do we kind of get into this mess? Like why do we have to intervene and make habitat and work for the birds to keep them alive? Is Essentially the plat used to be, the adage was an inch deep and a mile wide. I'm sure some of you guys have heard that but the birds also know that and they've been coming here for a long time and they need that wide shallow kind of ephemeral channel to eat and stalk or what is it uh, roost and essentially live so water projects essentially started in the early 1900s 1909 Fremont Canyon was filled, and that's the upstream most dam. Downstream, Lake McConaughey, you guys may be familiar with, and Kingsley Dam was finished in 1941. And by damming up the North Platte River, you've essentially retimed the hydrograph or the runoff. The Platte River is a snowmelt dominated hydrograph, so Rocky Mountains get a ton of snow over the winter, things warm up, water starts melting, and water just comes crashing down the South Platte and North Platte channels. These dams were put up to essentially harness that water and use it for beneficial uses, which is essentially us people, you know, flood protection, irrigation. It, 
holds all that water and retimes it so we don't get it in one big pulse during the month of July. Unfortunately, uh, we have beneficial uses, but not without consequences. By retiming that water, the downstream ecology is essentially interrupted. It's in a state of disturbance. So it's starting to look different than it used to. The channel doesn't look the same and the animals are in decline. So in the left-hand picture is a, a black and white picture, 1938. This is right near Kearney, Nebraska. The, there's a big island in the middle you can see here. It's kind of hard to see, but this is essentially an island and all these channels are active. Anything that isn't dark is an active channel. So it's, in this picture, it's about 4,000 feet wide. And here we are about 60 years later and the channel is reduced to a single thread channel that's in size considerably and it's starting to meander. It's no longer these braided shallow channels. It's getting deep, narrow, and it's starting to move laterally. And uh, unfortunately, the birds don't really do too well with that narrow incised channel. They need that wide shallow channel to hang out. So this is essentially terrible habitat and once it starts moving it's also very difficult to maintain and swing it back to good habitat. So zooming in, this is that same 1938 photo and this green line is sort of the high bank essentially. I'm going to leave it up there for reference. But you can kind of see all, of, all the braiding, some of the vegetated islands, lots of bare sand up in the top which there's already irrigation in the valley. You can see the Phelps County Canal here. So there's already irrigation projects, there's already pumping, people are already moving water around, but the river still kind of looks like the river's supposed to look. Let's fast forward to 1978, 40 years later. Here's that historic high bank, or at least the, the bank in the, uh, the last image, and it's starting to cut back pretty considerably. I mean, it's really moving around and getting into that high terrace. The, for reference, this is probably 15 feet above the channel. I mean, it's, it's already pretty well in size, but it's not looking so good anymore, at least with respect to what we need in central Nebraska. Fast forward another 30 years. The program is now active, but we're just starting to do work. So the problem is very obvious. The meanders are getting wider and longer, and say if you own this land here, you might start to be a little bit nervous about what that river's gonna do. It's now into the historic high bank, and just essentially tearing into that, what's now about a 20-foot tall terrace. So here we are, just about present day. This is three years ago. This is before we actually did a project in this reach. The channel has moved to the south, that first meander, about a thousand feet from where it was in 1938. Which again, if you're paying taxes on land, is, that kind of sucks. Uh, and again, if you were managing land for, say, endangered species, and this was your property boundary, the river's now off your property and you've got to try to manage that species on someone else's property, which isn't always easy. You know, private property is a pretty hard thing to approach. So, um, we've got to do something, right? So what do we do? I mean, as scientists and engineers and practicing professionals and ecologists, and we know there's a problem, we know we want to work on it, but the plan form is changing, and, and how do we turn that? Like, it's, it's not a bank erosion project where you can go in and cut it back and use bulldozers to grade it and put some willow stakes in and say, good, we stopped the erosion. I mean, the whole plan form is changing. You're going from one type of river to another. So we've got to get all of our tools in a row. And using adaptive management, we get our river mechanics book out and we figure out the hydraulics that are going on in the river and get a peg on sediment transport to know how much sediment is moving down that river. And we get our design criteria for the birds. But again, the scale, I mean, it's a hundred mile long reach and money is finite and land is finite and we need to figure out what to do. I mean, it's an alluvial river which this picture is not an alluvial river. This is the LA River. It has concrete banks, concrete bed, you know, steel guardrails, very rigid. If you wanted to design for something, you can. I think they even put a burr down here. Yeah, sure enough. It's all you need, right? 
Uh, but unfortunately, out here in Nebraska, we don't have concrete channels, but I might say fortunately, the river is alluvial in nature, which means that the bed and banks are composed of the same material as that river is transporting from upstream. So it's, it's essentially just sand. There's no hard points. If a river wants to go one way, it's going to go that way unless you intervene or it's in kind of a state of natural equilibrium in that it's, it's constantly disturbed, but overall it looks about the same, even though the fine details may look a little bit different. So now we know we're in an alluvial setting. This is a, another project in, in Uvis, California. It's a classic restoration example of trying to design in high, high sediment yields and flashy hydrology, which, which means you can get a big flow one year, no flow the next. I mean, it's just you can't really depend on regular flows. So this picture, someone decided we needed a meandering channel through this narrow valley or whatever it is, and you can see they put up some riprap on the banks to kind of lock that meandering channel in place so, it's, so it doesn't meander. And three months later, there was a big rainstorm, and all the sediment upstream of that project completely buried it. If you see, this is the same tree. This project was taken three months after the flood. So even though you went in, you did your due diligence, you, did, you got your permits, you put in the rock, you put up a, a rock revetment to make sure that channel that you designed stays there, and three months later, it's gone. So to kind of deal with that on the Platte River, we started monitoring. Uh, so we, we get the program going, and we start monitoring the reach, so people go out, every year or, or twice a year or whatever the protocol was and you, you see what's going on, you measure cross sections, you see what the bed's doing, you see what the vegetation's doing to try to get an idea of what this variability is that we're operating within and, and how we're going to push it towards something that's going to support birds or endangered species. So we kicked off pilot projects on small scales to see what kind of disturbances those are and how successful they are at staying do effective monitors to see, or effectiveness monitoring to see how well those pilots do. And then once we kind of figure this out, there's this concert of activity going on in the basement. We don't, we don't just start on the top and start fixing it and march our way down. We kind of pick and choose and find the problem areas and manage it as we go. So without vegetation, this is a pretty broad assumption, but all rivers would be braided. If, if we didn't have so much vegetation, Bosch and I here might not have much work to do out here. So invasives are hit really hard. I mean, it's Roundup coming out of a helicopter. It's not sexy, but it works. Uh, we disc up bars to tear up permanent, ve or, uh, permanent vegetation and burn woody vegetation just to keep the, that sand essentially available to be mobile, if that makes sense. Once it's locked in is where we start to get incisions. So if this vegetation grows and stays, this channel has nowhere to move but down. So it's going to just keep incising and, and narrowing more and further compounding the problem. So we know this isn't enough and we keep going and we figure out what's going on with sediment transport. So like I say, rivers, they transport sediment and water. And you can't stop that unless you run out of sediment. If you hit bedrock or like LA River where you get to concrete and we figured this out, so over ranges of discharge, say between 1,200 and 12,000 CFS, we kind of have a fair good idea of what's going on. This is kind of a complicated graph, but essentially all you really need to know is there's a lot of scatter. Like every time you get 3,000 CFS in the channel, you don't always get uh, you know, 400 tons or 1,200 tons per that. It, there's, it's just there's a lot of variability with it. So, we know we can't figure it out, and we know there's a little bit of slop in there. So that's something to consider when we're going into design. To add to that, in the pilot projects, we've got widening up in the upper left-hand corner to kind of get rid of that narrowing problem. We widen the channel, knock some of the stream power out of it to keep it from having that downward erosive force. We knock off bar tops so they might be more likely to be inundated and transport material over that and scour vegetation off the top and to address the sediment deficit problem from all the dams and the interrupted hydrology, we've begun augmenting sediment to the channel to essentially try to bring that channel bed back up 
and be braided again so it's not hitting the, the valley floor and wandering like it was in those images earlier. Excuse me. So to remind you of the scale, this is the associated habitat reach. It was from that first figure that was in green, that was small kind of sliver that went up the middle. It's bounded by Chapman, which is just downstream of Grand Island, and Lexington. And it's about a 100-mile reach that we focus all of our attention on. What you see in red is anywhere we've done projects that you've seen in those past images, like burning and vegetation and uh, or vegetation removal, bar disking, sediment augmentation, widening, things like that are all in those red footprints. So it's like I say, it's not just a, a bank erosion or a small refuge that we're creating. We're really making an impact on the landscape. So what did we learn from all this? I mean, essentially, if you try to go rigid and design it how you want it to look on the ground, like if, uh, for instance, a hooping crane, we've learned, likes to see a 650 foot wide unvegetated channel that's about a foot or less deep. It, it just, that's what they like. That's what we want to see. But if we build that, we might not get it right. If you build it too big, you can essentially kind of screw up your channel geometry where you'll still swing to one side of that channel that you just dug and it'll incise in that. So you could remove all this material and still end up with what you had started with if you don't get it right. So we stay away from kind of rigidity. We, we set it up and it looks very engineery, I'll say. But I mean, essentially so far it works. We, we work with the existing conditions and, and manage stream power. Because stream power is essentially your, I won't say enemy, that sounds so combative. But that's that erosive force that you're trying to harness and not completely get rid of because you still need to move sediment, but you want it to not move sediment faster than you, know, you want it to. So we, we set the, the channel up. We essentially undersize, undersize it and straight line it and, and let the river do the work. So I will do hydraulic computations, size a channel that just fits it, which is very different from working in, say, like a gravel bed river where, if you guys are familiar with the term freeboard, you would build a channel and then give yourself a little extra room so it didn't flood. So if it came up, it, uh, if you didn't do a good enough job, essentially, you wouldn't flood the surrounding area. But the Platte River doesn't work like that. It gets wider with discharge. It doesn't necessarily increase in stage. I mean, it does obviously some, but it's not a very stage responsive river. It gets wider and wider and wider. So we essentially size the channel to convey just enough water and the channel will move material and widen itself to get to where it wants to be instead of over widening it and then having this channel perched in the sediment. Um, if you're familiar with the term stage zero implementation, it's a, it's a recent idea that's going on in the Northwest uh, that essentially is approaching a similar problem that we are here in Nebraska. It's, our problem is the birds are in decline and it's, they depend on the river up there. It's a salmon fishery that's still somewhat intact, but it's declining rapidly. And you don't have five to 10 years to see your project develop and then not be good and then go in and do it. They just don't, they don't have time, like they've got to act. So they've essentially come up with this thing called stage zero, stage zero implementation, which instead of having a, a channel on one side with a floodplain like you might see in a typical cross section, they take that incised channel and fill it. You, you ultimately get rid of the channel except for where there's really key habitat areas like deep pools or spawning gravel or something and reset it. So you take the floodplain and the channel and you kind of bring it back up to reconnect all the water to the channel, spread that water out and increase the essentially available habitat. So we're doing a similar thing here that we're taking these terraces in these incised areas and scraping them off into the active channel to bring the incision up and give the, the channel essentially something to chew on to, to move sand down the river. So this doesn't look very natural, does it? I mean, we see the, the meander that the river created itself, but it's just kind of a trapezoid is what we designed and scrape this bar down and it just doesn't look very natural, but the nice thing is this river kind of takes care of that for us. If, if we don't overbuild something and we set it up right, the river will size itself, essentially. So to walk through that, 
this was our first full-scale statement augmentation project to try to reverse that plan form change. It's, it hasn't gone throughout the whole reach right now. It's pretty well contained above the Overton Bridge, at least this problem. But it's a, it's a great place to try to see if this is going to work. So the polygon on top is the channel. So essentially, we're going to put up a berm. I'll show you from here. Put up a berm here, reroute the channel into this north side, augment all that sediment downstream into the channel. We augmented more sediment around here to fill in the incised channel, and then scraped off the rest of this bar and hauled it over here to pay the landowner for letting us work on the property for a month and muck up his channel and stage heavy equipment and all that. Uh, in the process, though, it also curbed the erosion, so he was pretty happy. Probably uh, everyone won on this job, but essentially it, it worked. We ended up putting about 60,000 yards down this way, or excuse me, 60,000 tons. A ton is, uh, one yard is about one and a half tons, so 60,000 yards in the channel is, or excuse me, 60,000 tons is 40,000 yards, which is, if you can imagine, a football field three feet deep. It's about eight of those, essentially. It's a lot of sediment. So eight football fields worth of sediment out into the channel, another two football fields down here, and then another three or four football fields over in that pivot. Totaling about 115,000 tons of sand. So yeah, in summary, 60,000 to the main channel, 25 to the cutoff meander, and, and 30 to repair the pivot for, was, 172 and change, it was like 238 or 240 a, a yard. It was just a, a great deal for a project of, of this stature. And essentially, they did it all with scrapers and an excavator. So the 2018 approach was much more like a, a stage zero. You essentially take the channel from here across this point bar, and all of this material gets pushed into the channel, so we're not cutting anything off. There's nothing tricky. There's no training berms or anything like that. We literally just even out the channel. So we take this, disconnect, this disconnected floodplain, or it's a floodplain terrace. This doesn't get wet anymore under any circumstances. I mean, this is essentially, there's, there's prairie cactus growing on it. There's a few trees that have deep enough roots to make it. But it's, it's upland, and it doesn't really serve any habitat. So we're scraping this off to be crane habitat and bring that incised channel back up and you can see the old project from the previous year up top. So we're essentially increasing that bed elevation as we march down this channel. Starts out looking pretty stick figurey. Say it's all, you know, three to one side slopes. There's not much natural looking to it, if you will. Uh, this was done by one guy in a bulldozer. He did it in about a month, and this is what it ended up looking like. So all that sand that was on this bar and at this elevation is now out in this channel and going down. It's raising up the bed elevation, and bars like this are starting to get cut up. So, so far, we're starting to see a little bit of braiding. We're seeing some vegetation scouring. The bed is coming up slowly, uh, but the material is kind of coarse. It, it's not as ideal as it could be, but we essentially did it again. We got another 60,000 tons into the main channel without adverse effects for a little over a, what was it, a dollar something a yard, dollar 29 a yard. And we're just monitoring this, uh, let's see, twice a year with LIDAR and near infrared photography from uh, Cessna flights. We have a drone we go out quarterly and watch to make sure banks are, aren't eroding and we're not uh, kind of creating more adverse effects than we're fixing. And we go out and take GPS transects too, just to make sure the bed is staying where it is and we're not creating more incision or, you know, we're essentially getting what we want to see. So to show you what this looks like on the ground, we're going to just fly through the whole site. If it'll let me. There we go. So this is the, the site from last year. The bar is about halfway done. The construction's not complete here. You can still see the bulldozers on the side. I think he was out getting fuel or something like that. But essentially, nothing bad's going on. We put 60, we're putting 60,000 tons of sand into this channel, and it's just widening out. We're not getting scouring on the left bank. You can see it reworking some of the sediments in here when the stage comes up. 
but really it's it, things are coming together well. I, we don't see a lot of braiding yet, but once uh, irrigation picks up and flows start kicking this channel to heck and back, I imagine we will start seeing it. So here the bars are cutting up. We're seeing more erosion here on this bank, and it's essentially self-augmenting. It needs sediment, and that's why it's meandering essentially. So by us taking all that sand and putting it in the channel, it spreads the water out and moves the sediment essentially more slowly. So it has what it needs and can handle some high flows. There it is. So here we are halfway through. I think it's going to fly. Yeah, there we go. So here's the 2017 project. The pilot channel is what we're flying up. It's, it's essentially doubled in width and the bed has stayed the same. The old meander here on the left side of the screen has turned into a pretty good wetland. Uh, all of this is now filled in with vegetation and it backwaters as the irrigation flows from upstream come back. So it goes from about 300 feet wide at low flow to about 600 feet wide at a high flow. And that's just the difference between uh, power, power generation returns. This whole channel is essentially uh, run by power return flows. And that's why we're here doing this, is that, that power return caused this incision. There's, it's a clear water return. There's no sediment coming in. It's just water and it mined all that sediment out there over about 80 years. So we're trying to find a way essentially to reverse that so these things can keep operating and we can still keep irrigating and we can still have birds and still have a river. And that's essentially where we are. So I'm here to talk about the, the physical part, the channel itself and how we got to where we are and Dave's gonna tell you about the ecology. So on that, you have any questions for me? Yeah. So in, river river in yeah. this channel, 18 years. Uh, we've identified, well, at least worth of floodplain terraces. So from that graph before, uh, the one graph I showed that had the discharge and sediment moving, based on that, we have an 18 year supply, which isn't forever. But we also don't know if it's gonna work and it also, it might end up being a 50 year supply. So we're going, essentially, we're gonna just keep shoving it in. We've got five years on the 404 permit. And at that point, we've got to evaluate, do we extend the permit, do we cease, or do we take five years off and just let it work through that sediment and see what happens? Maybe th we just fill this whole thing up with sand and it just sits there for <coughs> five years. Like if we go into drought, for instance, and we don't have return flows, we're not gonna move sand. So that's the adaptive part of it. From your opening slides of uh, uh, the uh, damming effects, cutting out the uh, spring, early summer flushes, it, 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 just to make a s simple statement, it looks like they're substituting bulldozers for uh, spring floods. That's part of it. So what kind of, I mean, a thousand dollars a cubic yard <coughs> for thousand dollars per thousand cubic yards, um, is this maintenance going to have to happen in perpetuity? Is this going to be able to self-maintain? It's a, it's a little bit of an art. So yes, uh, part of it is the vegetation. So we've got to essentially keep going on the vegetation. We don't get the flows that we need. I mean, 2015 we did. We need high, high magnitude, long duration, you know, 12,000 CFS over 40 days. If that happens every year, Bosch and I don't need to really do anything. The whole channel will maintain itself, but we don't see that every year. So in the interim years, when we don't get floods, or say we don't get a big flood, small floods still do work, but not the work we need, and that's where the diesel fuel comes in. Uh, part of the program is we're trying to get water. That's one aspect of it. It's actually about a third of it. It's this next 13 years is a big focus to try to get water to operate to flood. In the past, we've done short duration high flows, things like 
couple thousand CFS for a couple of days to see how that does, because that's what we could feasibly get for as much as water costs and what it takes to control it and get it to this particular part of the river. Um, but diesel is cheaper than water. It's kind of the issue. But there's, there's irrigators that don't want a single drop of the Platte River to go into Missouri. They want it to, to run their pits. Right. That's, I mean, that's, that's the tricky part is that's where the diesel comes in is we don't have the water, like you're saying. And there are floods that we can't capture. Like say we get a, like a September flood after irrigation. You know, we don't have no irrigation demands and we get the, like September 13 floods. That was a great example where we get 10,000 CFS comes ripping down the channel and nobody wants anything to do with it. But it's also not a time that we normally get floods. I mean, it's just kind of like, it's pretty contrived, I guess. The, the hydrology is contrived. Like we can just say that. It comes out of a valve. And if, no, if there's no takes, that's fine. It goes down the river, but you're right. It's, there's a lot of competition for the water. It makes it very expensive, especially for managing for the birds. Like I, I think this is in Dave's presentation, but right now we're on track to spend, was it $100 million on water in the next 13 years? That's a chunk of change. Yes? So you're talking about um, education management and freeing up the alluvial sands, right? Um, so I guess my question would be, has it been taken into account like where this herbicide or like Roundup would deposit and the effects of working with that material over a long time? I can't, I mean, I can't speak to it. I, I'm not a, a biologist or ecologist or know anything about the chemical makeup of Roundup. I, in my mind, I don't like it. I mean, I don't, I, I want to see it flood, but we also have all these constraints. We're not actually applying Roundup. It's a uh, water uh, aquatic approved, aquatic labeled uh, herbicide. And yes, they've done numerous tests on it. Is there any adverse effect? I don't believe that. I believe there are adverse effects we just don't know what they are yet. It's back in the day we used to apply DDT to everything. And we found out how terrible it is for most everything. I mean, it did a great job at what you're applying it for, but it had so many adverse effects that that's why it's banned now. Um, so we are applying an aquatic labeled um, herbicide, but the effects of it right now are suspected to be minimal at I guess best or worst, whichever we want to consider it. <coughs> but we also are open for, for better ideas. Like we use that for specifically for Phragmites essentially is it propagates through seeds, tubers. If you chop the plant up, those little parts will grow. So even burning it doesn't kill it. So they essentially over the last, what is it, since 2008, we've been spraying this and it's about the only thing that works. Even floods just move it downstream. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? How do you fund all this? The funding, where does that come from? The finding? Funding. Oh, funding. Uh, it's mostly Bureau of Reclamation is the cash. Uh, there's a little bit of cash from the state of Colorado. There might, I think Nebraska is mostly just the land and, and water, but the, the cash essentially comes from the Bureau of Reclamation from power generation money. So they sell power from all these dams on the North Platte for cash, and then they fund the mitigation essentially. So we offset their damage and they bankroll it. I mean, it works it, and, and no one wants to see this shut down is kind of the big thing. As long as we keep pushing the birds in the right direction, everyone gets to do business as usual. And that's kind of the cool thing about this program is we're not taking anything away from anybody. Like the program itself pays taxes. If we do conservation land, we don't take that off the tax books. We pay the taxes on that so we don't have the local eco economical effect or whatever. So it's, it's good neighbor policies and everyone has a stake in the game. Like we were run by the governance committee that sits, that are stakeholders for all these water users too. So all decisions are made by the people that have the stake in the game and us as headwaters just implement their decisions. So we do the background science for them. If they have a question, we do it and they make decisions based on that. Like we're, we're essentially independent, as, like I say, with the, the roundup or whatever. It's not great, but it's, it's what we decided on and it's, it works. So it's, it's the greatest thing for now. So that's, that's how we operate and how it's funded. 
Anybody else? All right, I'll hand you on to Dave. Okay, I'll take the mic off. Okay, can you hear me okay and everything? Okay, if I get to yelling, I'll take this thing off, but, but uh, um, I'm gonna roll into the uh, next um, part of our presentation. Tom covered all the hydrology and all the, some of the physical mechanical work we do and the, um, to create habitat for these species. I'm gonna talk about the species now and some of the responses we've seen and some of the experiments we've done with the species as far as, um, learning about how to best utilize our resources to protect and enhance these species recovery. Um, the two species I'm going to talk about today are the interior least tern and the piping plover. Um, the interior least tern are an, uh, an endangered species. The piping plover are a threatened species. They nest on the Missouri River, the lower Platte River, so they, they nest throughout the um, central U.S. Um, on a lot of river systems. Uh, the objective of the, um, one of the primary objectives of the program for turns and plovers is to increase productivity. How do we increase productivity? Increase the number of birds. How do you increase the number of the birds? The concept was if you increase the habitat, the birds will come. And uh, so the more habitat there is, the more birds you can support, the, the better the population will do as a whole. So similar concept to what they're doing on the Missouri River um, as far as building uh, in channel islands and different things. We took a different approach. Well, we took that approach, plus oh, we've taken a, a slightly different approach as well. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the program implements its uh, uh, science experiments through an adaptive management program, like Tom mentioned. Um, we uh, uh, make decisions, well, we use the, use the science to inform our decisions about what's best for the birds. We use what the birds tell us. I'll get into this a little bit later. We'll use what the birds tell us to decide what's best for them, and then we use that science to uh, dictate how the money and resources are allocated. So um, when I began back in 2009, there were two very uh, highly competing paradigms. One was if you build the, build the habitat in the channel, the birds will come, and the birds that, I mean, we've known for years the birds nest on sand pits as well as islands. So the one of the paradigms was if you build islands, they'll actually leave the sand pits and do better on the river islands. The other one, the other idea was if you build more sand pits, they'll come to the sand pits and, and overall the birds will do better. So two very different competing uh, paradigms, paradigms existed back in the, um, like I say, 2009 when I started. Um, and very fortunately, I guess the program was able to develop a very robust uh, science plan to test these different hypotheses, these different paradigms, uh, to let the birds, like I say, let the birds tell us what, uh, what they want and, and uh, where they're gonna do better at. So um, the science plan, I'm gonna talk about a couple of the different uh, um, um, components of the science plan. It included in-channel islands as well as off-channel habitats. So we testing them both at the same time, same place, uh, to figure out what, uh, what the birds want. Um, as far as the in-channel islands go, uh, we had uh, a different, uh, we had a um, unique um, design plan where we got these small islands, which are more, these are kind of more natural. They were pushed up by bulldozers because the river won't build them itself. But if, if the river were to build islands, this is kind of a more natural, about a two acre island, low elevation. So a typical spring runoff would overtop it. You can see a lot of this islands overtop already. We have the bigger islands. We can see the footprint of the bigger island here mostly overtopped again because it's the lower elevation, somewhat natural, but a larger scale island. And then we have the big, the high islands that won't get overtopped until the water goes out, out of the bank. So we build it basically so the river won't uh, overtop it. And then we have the small high islands, again, not to be overtopped, but just smaller in size to see. Are there birds selecting for these more natural looking islands? The higher elevation, the smaller, the bigger. What are they? What are the birds looking for when they're 
when they're nesting, when they're coming here in the spring to nest in, the, in May, and, May and June. So, um, <coughs> excuse me, the idea of these lower islands, both the big and small, was if you get a good pulse of flow coming through, the water would maintain the vegetation for you. So we don't have to use pre-emergent herbicides, which you were getting to. I mean, there's, there's nothing perfectly safe. I mean, there's a reason it's out there. There's a reason we use it. But so the island, the water would overtop it and scour the vegetation off and keep it bare sand for the birds. These larger ones, we knew going in, the water wasn't going to overtop it. So we had to maintain those with herbicide. Um, so that was what we, uh, 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 the concept of, of that experimental design with islands. Here's a zoomed in version of that, uh, some of those same islands. Again, you can see these lower islands are being overtopped by this kind of natural flow, if there is anything natural in this system. Um, and then the larger islands are, are high and dry. Same design experiment on another site. Uh, we did, uh, you can see the difference in size of the islands and, and the elevations are different. And so, um, so we had this, uh, this experiment implemented at two different sites. Both of these sites had off-channel habitat, sampled habitat right beside it. So they could, I mean, it wasn't a locational issue that they're showing up in this island and not seeing the sand pits or whatever or, or vice versa. So they're able to select which one they wanted, the off-channel or in-channel. And on the in-channel, which one do they want? The high, low, big, small. So they can, they had choices to, uh, to help uh, inform, um, uh, help us inform what they, what they want and, and uh, to, like I say, better allocate money in the future towards uh, what's going to work for the birds. Um, what we found on, through this island study, uh, the creation of island, uh, in this island design study was the birds generally preferred the higher islands and the bigger islands. So the small um, high islands didn't get much use at all. It was the bigger islands that uh, the, the most unnatural, I guess, as far as the system goes, were the ones that were getting used when they did get used. Um, the problem we had, though, was the islands eroded away so quickly. Uh, anytime a pulse flow came through, the islands went away. And the problem is if there's nests and chicks on the island and it goes away, so do they. So we had terrible productivity and low use on our islands. Even, even though we did have some use, um, productivity was terrible and, and uh, use overall was uh, um, fairly low. So uh, at the same time, we were creating off-channel habitats like I, like I mentioned. And you can see in this example, this particular off-channel habitat, what we do is we excavate. We came in just from bare earth, excavated the material and piled it. Uh, and, uh, to, and you put the dirt on the bottom and the sand that's below that on top and created this 20 acre nesting, uh, nesting area. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> at, at first we were trying to save funds by not removing all the trees along the river. We let this site go for about two, three years and we had absolutely no response from the birds. They, they uh, just simply didn't use the site. We came back in. Um, after three years and took out all the trees. You can see in the channel also there's some islands that we constructed um, for nesting. So the islands and sand pits are just side by side. So they had choices definitely. Um, finally got a response. Birds started using that off-channel habitat. Um, but it, that particular site was built because we took all the dirt and everything and piled it in the middle. That was built about 20 foot tall, so it's got a nickname of Mount Cottonwood. <laughs> if you drive by after a snowstorm, occasionally you'll see a snow peak on it, and people give us all kinds of hard time about that. But, but anyway, um, so this, this was one design we implemented. Um, a very tall um, nesting area, uh, guaranteed to be high and dry regardless of the situation. Another design we had where we actually had uh, uh, took advantage of the Department of Roads wanted some topsoil material to build uh, uh, bridges with. <clears throat> so we had them come in and excavate off the top three foot of soil. So they took the top three foot that we didn't want. They used it for their project. In return for that soil, <clears throat> they built us uh, a turn and plover nesting island here. Uh, cost us nothing. What we ended up with uh, was a site that's elevations about eight to ten feet high. Uh, similar design, got water surrounding it, um, and 
As soon as we got this site built, the, we built it and they finished in the fall. And the next spring, uh, we had birds nesting all over this thing and we've had ever since and productivity has been high and so what we found between the off channel designs was that big high design isn't nearly as preferred as these lower elevation type of designs this will never overtop with flood or with flow um, but it uh, but it's not as high and uh, so the, and the birds really really like it so um, so the first hypothesis, like I mentioned, was <clears throat> if you increase habitat, will the birds respond? <clears throat> you can see the green line is habitat. It was flat. The amount of habitat was flat until the program started. We started constructing habitat in 2009. Habitat goes up. Bird numbers go up. Same with plovers. Ha uh, numbers were flat. 2009 we start building habitat and the bird numbers go up so the answer to that question is obviously a resounding yes if you build it they will come um, <coughs> excuse me and productivity on these off-channel habitats has been very high as well so um, you lost my figure Tom Okay, well, imagine this nice, pretty figure here. <laughs> you got in-channel nesting down here. You got off-channel, well, in-channel nesting and off-channel nesting. What we found is, even though we created about the same amount of habitat in-channel and off-channel, in-channel nesting was down here, off-channel nesting came up here. So in-channel nesting, we just never got much abundance. And uh, productivity, like I mentioned, was very low because of islands getting inundated and, and nests getting flooded. <laughs> Off-channel productivity, like I said, you saw that previous graph that I did actually include. Um, the uh, productivity or the abundance of birds is going up very steadily with habitat. So, um, <clears throat> so what we've done is through our different experiments and stuff. For one, we went through a structured decision-making process to decide: okay, we, do we want to spend? a half million dollars a year constructing in-channel islands, or do we want to spend a half million dollars construct, I mean, that's annual cost, or do we want to spend a half million dollars and build an off-channel site that's going to be permanent? Obviously, with the islands going away and the birds doing poorly on the islands, it's an obvious choice that off-channel habitat's where you want to spend your money. So, um, uh, we monitor the birds from the 1st of May through September 1st every year. We go out twice a week checking these birds to monitor productivity. So we're, we're keeping a great eye, a close eye on what the birds are doing. Um, we collect data about locational information of where the birds are nesting and all that good fun stuff. Um, then we did detailed analyses to figure out, okay, what exactly on these off-channel sand pits do they seem to be selecting for? What do they prefer? <clears throat> and the idea is let, us tell, let the birds tell us what they like and let's build that for them. Um, we've had great success with that. Um, <coughs> what we found is, <coughs> let me get my facts out here, but uh, keeping trees back 500 feet from the nesting area is where they tend to nest, the 500 feet or more. Uh, you get trees up close, you got predators, avian predator perches and, and issues with the, with the nests and chick losses associated with predation. So keep the trees back about 500 feet. Uh, piping plovers, uh, one species we deal with, prefer to nest about 100 to 200 feet from the shoreline. They feed on invertebrates. The invertebrate abundance is much higher along the wet sand than it is in the higher dry sand. So about 100 to 200 foot off the shoreline, we incorporated a, we incorporated a low bait design so that to increase the foraging area, if this was flat, you'd have less foraging area. So we increased the foraging area by in, including a low bait design. Um, and they like to nest about five to seven feet high. So they're definitely high and dry. They're not gonna get inundated, and, and, uh, but they don't nest nearly as high as interior easterners do. They interior easterners like to be higher yet, further away from the water, still the same distance from trees. They wanna be about 500 feet from trees, but just on the higher areas that are a little bit further from the shoreline. So um, again, the design is to maximize the shoreline for plovers and uh, increase the elevation and distance to waterline for turns 
and uh, we've had phenomenal response to these. This is a site, it happens to be a 60 acre site. Um, like Tom was talking, the, the scale and magnitude of the scale we deal with is not small. Uh, this is one site. We've got numerous sites out there on sand pit sites, so, so we aren't operating on a, on a small scale, not in a, a small sandbox, I guess, per se. Um, uh, kind of wrap things up here just a little bit. We've learned a lot about the species in their habitat the last 13 years. Um, we're moving into, like Tom said, we're moving into a 13 year extent, extension. So 2020 to 2032, we'll be learning about uh, um, a lot more about the water. Water, like Tom said, is very expensive. Very, very expensive. Uh, we're talking the next 13 years, we're going to be spending over $100 million on water. And that's if we stop what we're planning on. <laughs> If we want an additional 10,000 acre feet of water, which is just a number for you guys, and it's just a number for me, honestly, it's uh, kind of incomprehensible. But anyway, that's, that's $40 million, and that is not a lot of water um, in the grand scheme of things. So, um, and our research, uh, similar to what we've done so far on the birds, is to be focused on how best to use the water. When you're playing with this kind of money, you want to do it right and you want to know how to go forward so you're not spending $100 million every 13 years uh, developing new water for the, <clears throat> for the species. So with that, I'll address any questions. If you, have, if you have any questions for Tom, I'm sure he would love to stand up and address those too, but yes, sir. That's a great question. Uh, what we are going to do going forward, there's two lines of, two paradigms there as well. One is you send a big pulse flow through and it takes them out. The other idea is rather than sending that big pulse flow through, you send, in, you send through a moderate level during the growing season to keep the sandbars inundated. If the sandbars are underwater, then obviously the seeds aren't gonna germinate. <clears throat> so you keep the channel clean that direction. So we're gonna be testing that to see which is the most economical and provides the best bang for your buck as far as uh, uh, keeping the cottonwoods and uh, uh, willows and that kind of species out. Phragmites is a monster. They're, they're flow, it doesn't matter how much flow we got. You could probably yank out McConaughey Dam and have that water come through and it wouldn't hardly touch Phragmites, it'd just irritate it. Oh, you're talking about off-channel sites, how do we maintain vegetation? Yeah, how, yeah, how do you deal with those islands that are not, that you've created there that are offline, won't get the flow? Gotcha, yes, we, uh, we put a pre-emergent herbicide on them every spring, and uh, herbicide's the answer. I mean, it's, it's the only way to keep vegetation off. Your other, your other option is to disc it, and as soon as vegetation establishes, you lose the birds. No, we use a pre-emergent. Um, so we, we take care of it before they, before they germinate even uh, for the off-channel sites. Then when the vegetation, if the pre-emergent doesn't work, then we come in with a scraper, take off the vegetation, and we start over again the next year. But that, we spend about, on all of our sites combined, about $30,000 keeping them bare sand annually. Like I said, we were spending a half million dollars just building sandbars that went away the same year, plus we had to put herbicide on them. So it's, the cost is just so much more economical on, on uh, off-channel sites, yeah. You got the upfront cost of building the off-channel site, but then maintaining it is pennies on the dollar. How's the fishing in Marine Fantastic. <laughs> we got some of the best fishing, the only problem is we don't allow anybody, not even me, to fish it because we got our nesting birds there and don't want to disturb them. But you don't encourage that, right? Because those birds are sensitive to people walking around. Yeah, we, we don't allow fishing on them. They're restricted. And like I said, I can't even fish it myself, and that's unfortunate because we got some of the best bass and crappie fishing there is in the state right there. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. How do you, do you do anything to support like the 
Right now we haven't been. Um, uh, last year we had, um, for the piping plovers, the ones that feed on the invertebrates, we had some productivity issues at a few sites. We don't know if it was because of the cool weather, whether it was avian predation was just bad last year, whether it was the invertebrate abundance. So this year we are going to do a little bit of experimenting. We're going to go out on a few of our sites and with a harrow and just drag the shoreline to kind of stir up that sand and, and uh, see if that doesn't help. Um, or did, we're, right now we're just kind of investigating it and seeing if there's something we can do. But as far as stocking invertebrates and that kind of stuff, we don't do any of that now. Oh no, they, they're there. Yeah, and we actually did uh, some testing last year. We had one site that had, I mean, very high productivity. I think every chick that hatched fledged. Another site had zero that hatched fledged. And so we started doing invertebrate sampling on the two sites and they were the same. The, the abundance of invertebrates was the same, so I don't think it was invertebrates, but we're still gonna tinker with it this year and just see if we can't figure something out and make sure it's not the invertebrates causing the problem for us. But another question right behind you? Yes, yes, and we, uh, because, uh, we've we spent a long, a lot of time learning about the geomorphology, the hydrology, the system response, the bird response, all that stuff, and we put out, I think, about 15 or 16 publications the last two years, so I've spent a lot of time publishing papers, and, other, and others in the office, we've, we collaborate on them, but yes, we do publish a lot of information. We have a platriverprogram.org um, website that has these publications on it, or you, we, we publish all of our articles open access, so anybody that wants them can get them. Uh, you don't have to pay for them, that kind of stuff. So yes, we do disseminate the information. We have annual, um, they're called State of the Platte Reports, where it updates all of our learning. That's available to the public. We have biannual reports, which update every two years. It tells us, basically give you, like this year's report will have what we've learned since 2007, all of it. And uh, so, Yes, we do make the information available, and uh, the easiest access is platriverprogram.org. You bet. Anything else for Tom or I? Yes. Yes, uh, yes we, we do. Um, I focus my presentation on turns and plovers just because that's, we're just to get over some experimental designs and, and uh, we have a heavy focus on whooping cranes. We've learned just as much about them. Um, did a lot of different experimental designs on, uh, for whooping cranes as well, so I could have presented on them just as, just as easily, but we uh, monitor bald eagle nests, we monitor um, migratory birds, we monitor river otters, we monitor a lot of things to make sure what we're doing is not causing problems. One thing about our off-channel sand pits is it's, we're building them just like they would a sand and gravel mine. So it's, we're not doing anything different than what's, than what's being done in the system already. So there shouldn't be a lot of negative impact. Obviously, if you take out a patch of trees to put a sand pit in, you have a localized impact on the arboreal nesting birds. I mean, obviously the trees are gone, so they can't nest or type of thing. but but uh, it's minimal impact, minimal footprint, I guess, on them when you consider we're dealing with 100 miles of a river. Yes? Any thoughts on how to integrate humans into this, i.e. ecotourism, uh, letting people come like when they come to view the river downstream, view the uh, cranes, is there a way to set up viewing platforms or stations so they can see the eagles and the turns that minimum is disrupted? Any thoughts on that? We do. Um, I've just got to come off a month, uh, about five weeks of touring daily. We take people out. We charge nothing for the tours. It's, it's a phone call to our office. Um, you get a, a day you want to come out, uh, a group up to 16. We got, we got enough blinds to hold 35 people and 40 people in a day. Um, so, so yes, we do a lot of public outreach like that. 
Um, one thing Tom mentioned, uh, another thing Tom mentioned was uh, our good neighbor policy. We own 12,500 acres of land. Seven, over 7,000 acres of that land is open to public access. Uh, you go online and make a reservation. It's not like Game and Parks land where anybody can go out there any day. Uh, we, res we let the reservations we made. We have about one person per 100 acres. So it, it's, the idea is to make it a better experience for when you go out there viewing nature, you're not competing with 75 other people out there. If you want to go out hunting turkeys or deer or ducks or pheasants, you're not competing with 100 people out there in a day. So you basically go online. So we do open our lands up to public access. Um, we do a lot of tours uh, during the summer. People interested, uh, especially the University of Nebraska, Lincoln and Kearney folks, uh, take them out to our Turner Plover nesting sites, not on the site, but where we do our monitoring from the outside of the site. Let them look through scopes and learn about the birds and we talk to them. And, and so, yeah, we do a lot of public outreach. Who's the landowner of record? Do they pay taxes? Yes, we do pay taxes on all of our land, yep. Uh, the Platte River Recovery Implementation Foundation, because <laughs> the Platte River Recovery Program is nothing but a name. It's nothing but a, a bunch of words put together. <laughs> The foundation was formed to be the uh, land holding entity. And what's the relationship between that organization and the uh, Crane Trust? Uh, the Crane Trust serves on our um, governing body and our advisory committees, but we are completely separate from them. Our land is one block of land, there, and same with Rose Sanctuary. Uh, Rose Sanctuary serves on our committees, but our, but our lands are separate. We manage our lands, they manage their lands. Rose Sanctuary, for example, we've entered a management agreement with them, so we, we now manage their lands for them, so it costs them nothing, and, and we've entered a lot of agreements with private um, individuals to manage their land for the species, so we manage a lot of land. So, I think I saw a hand up over here. That's probably a better question for better question for Tom. One thing, the Phragmite is an invasive species. It wasn't here prior to the early 2000s. There, there's two types of Phragmites. There's the native, then this invasive. This invasive is a monster. But as far as incorporating that into some experimental designs for channel maintenance, it's such a monster. I just don't think you, I mean, if you leave one, one plant out there, the system's filled up within a year or two, just the entire system. And, Tom showed a picture when there's the Phragmite spraying. It was back in 2008. It was after the drought and Phragmite just moved in. Yeah, if you want to scroll back to that. The channels were, I mean, what used to be a mile wide were all confined to a channel less than the width of this room. That's, there might have been four or five of those, but just certainly not suitable for the species. Quite a ways back here towards your beginning. There we go. I mean, this, here's Phragmites. There's all your willows after you get stabilized, after Phragmites stabilizes things. This is the Platte River. It's not very wide, and it certainly is not suitable for the birds that, we, that we're concerned with. Yes? Yes. 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 All the time. Um, what we do in an active mining situation when we when we document a Turner plover nest in those active areas, we put a flag there. We don't shut down the mining operation. We don't do that. We just put a flag by it, about five feet away, and inform the miner. If you can avoid this area, we would appreciate it. If you if if the nest fails, shouldn't have nested there, I guess. And, and they always. To date, they've always been cooperative. They quit going to that area until the bird either hatches and the chicks can move, or, but it's not their responsibility to avoid that nest. If they intentionally run it over, they could be cited for take of a species, but, but we've never had an issue like that. Uh, and we work with those miners, active mining operations all the time. 
and we do convert <clears throat> the old mining sites especially they used to mine to 40 to 60 feet that left a lot of spoil it wasn't the most effective way so now they mine down to 80 90 100 feet well, i don't even know, maybe even deeper than that but what that does is it leaves more room they get more material more aggregate out more material goes back into the water so we don't have these nice peninsula nesting areas like we used to have so the sand and gravel mining operations have changed the way they operate their business to become more economical, which makes it less available habitat for these birds once they're done. We do some active mining where we make them, we own the land, and we require them to mine to 40 feet, which leaves us the spoil material. So as they mine, we get habitat for free. The problem with that approach is you only get two to three acres a year if they're mining with two, two dredges. And so it takes a long time, taking 20, I mean, well, 10 years to get 20 acres of a habitat. So it's, it's just much quicker to, to go in and, and with an excavator and build it. So, I thought it was a hand pop over here. Yes? So, um, part of our purpose of this symposium is to sort of talk about the collaboration that occurs between the different participants in these processes. <clears throat> Yeah, I'll start this, and then I'm going to have, have Tom uh, uh, help me out, fill in some details, I guess. But <clears throat> like Tom mentioned, we are, I, him and I both work for Headwaters Corporation, and what generally happens is we have ideas for ways to test these hypotheses that the program folks have. And there's a lot of program folks. You get the state of Nebraska, Wyoming, Colorado. Um, the Bureau of Reclamation, Fish and Wildlife Service, Rose Sanctuary, Crane Trust, Nature Conservancy, Central Public Power and Irrigation District, Nebraska Public, I mean, there's a ton of people that are actually our boss <laughs> that tell us what to do, but we come up with the ideas and ways of answering the questions they have. We present it to them. They either vote unanimously yes or it doesn't go forward. So it's everybody has buy-in at the table. Everybody has a stake in what we do. Um, so that's how we keep people at the table because they have a, they have a say in what we do. It's much different than most um, large-scale recovery programs um, where a single entity makes the decision what they're going to do and, and they, they do it. Um, so anyway, with that, uh, you want to add anything to that, Tom, or as far as the... Yeah, I guess to add to the collaboration, once, once we get outside that general governing body, uh, internally we have a lot of specialists. I mean, there's only, I think, 14 people in our company. But we've got four water resources engineers, I'm a fluvial geomorphology, we've got a biosystems engineer, some biology techs, uh, ecologist, Dave, what's your, how do you know your job? Yeah, <laughs> I am. Wildlife biologist. Wildlife biologist that got demoted to the office. <laughs> yeah, so we've got all these specialists, so we all collaborate with each other. Like, I'm doing a sediment augmentation design. I go to Dave and I'm like, well, what do the birds need? So I incorporate the birds' needs into my physical construction project essentially so we try to hit all the marks we can and make sure we're all doing our due diligence to essentially do our best work on the river I just know we're not just pigeonholed into our office and I'm working on this thing all by myself like it's it's highly collaborative very collaborative within our office yes and there's no paved route is why it has to be I mean no we are we're all figuring this out as we go which is terrifying and exciting and I think it's why we do it yep Yep. I mean, it's a difference of opinion is not a threat, right? It's just a difference of opinion, right? So we argue with each other and we talk it through and sometimes it takes a long time. But I think the success of the program is that that difference of opinion is not a threat. That we all sit down until we're comfortable. We design experiments to test. You've got this opinion, you got this opinion, because how do we figure out which one of you are right? <laughs> or what's best for the birds. I don't care if either of you are right. It's what's best for the birds. And we've done that through a structured decision-making process where we present, okay, I mean, that's what we did for the turns and plovers to get to the off-channel. I mean, cost isn't everything. If, if the end channel is better for the birds and it costs a little more, we're gonna do what's better for the birds. Um, but we come through, okay, productivity is this. If we continue to build this habitat, here's how many fledglings you expect in 
10 years, if we spend this money and build off-channel habitat, here's your fledge ratios, here's how many birds you'd expect to fledge in 10 years or 50 years or whatever. And, and there, there's people that still don't like the fact we don't build in-channel habitat. They don't like it, but they understand why we don't. We went through that decision-making process and everybody in the program bought into, yes, this is the best way for the birds. We don't like it, but it's the best way for the birds, so let's go that way. So it's a very collaborative and negotiated process. A lot of give and take. Any other questions? I think we have about 10 minutes. If, we, if not, we can be ahead of schedule. I'd be okay by everybody, I'm sure. Great. Well, thank you guys very much. Great questions.